Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. We are very delighted to have Professor uh, Kumar from the New Jersey Institute of Technology in US uh, with us. He's talking about uh, self-assembling peptide hydrogels and tissue mimics. Uh, but before going to his presentation, as always, I have some housekeeping notes. If you have any question, the, the ask a question box uh, is on the bottom of your page. You can ask your question there. The chat box is just for uh, interacting with each other. You can also put your messages there. Uh, there is a poll box uh, to uh, kind of help us to improve the future seminars. You can take the polls and uh, and also, the, this uh, uh, seminar will, will be continuing with the great speakers. Next week, we have uh, Professor Asha, uh, Asha Mahi from the uh, Department of Bioengineering at uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Uh, and uh, please uh, follow us on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn to get the most updated information about the upcoming seminars. And then uh, last but not the least, uh, we always thank our sponsor, Montreal Transmit Tech Institute, to uh, provide this opportunity to uh, and this platform to have this uh, seminar for almost now a year. So uh, now we have our 43rd uh, uh, seminar today with uh, Professor Kumar. So. Uh, now this is the time I go to introduce uh, Professor Kumar. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering uh, from Northwestern University in 2006 and a doctorate degree in biomedical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology in 2011. His expertise is in the area of tissue engineering, drug development and delivery, and a specific research interests are in the area of inflammation uh, modulation and angiogenesis, especially in understanding the role of a small growth factor or cytokine mimics uh, ability to signal biological process. He is the co-author of the over 3,000 uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, over 4,000 abstracts, and an inventor on a dozen patents and applications. And serial, and he is a serial entrepreneur. He actually started up three startups today. Uh, uh, Professor Kumar has served at the New Jersey Institute of Technology as an assistant professor in biomedical and chemical engineering at, at the Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. Uh, he teaches biomaterials and biomedical translation and entrepreneurship. As a pre-health advisor and a member of the BME Faculty Search Committee, University IP Committee, and uh, endowed uh, flow of the Albert Dorman Honors College, uh, he strives to encourage research involvement with undergraduate, graduate, and post, uh, postdoctoral scientists. Research in the Kumar lab uh, aims at translating technologies in startups. Uh, he has uh, the starts of non, uh, non geo TX or uh, SAP HTX towards treating a wide array of pathologies. To this end, he is a frequent member of the SBIR, STTR, and NIH study sections and served as a reviewer for over a dozen uh, peer-reviewed journals. For those who made it this so far, this far into the abstract, check out. <laughs> okay, so no, this is, uh, this is that actually he put it uh, on the uh, uh, bio. Okay, Vivek, uh, by that, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, actually excited to hear about uh, your journey towards, uh, you know, uh, advancing this translational technology in your lab uh, towards the startups, and uh, we are very happy to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, yes. Can't see. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, I'm going to start out by apologizing. I have the hiccups. <laughs> so, you might hear a lot of hiccups <laughs> uh, throughout this presentation. So uh, thank you for the phenomenal introduction. Um, the work that we do at the Kumar Lab uh, at the New Jersey Institute of Technology focuses on taking different materials, different combinations of materials and translating them or trying to answer some of the translational questions to move them from basic science research all the way to the clinic. Now, 
Uh, one of the biggest challenges with translating these technologies, as we were talking about right before the seminar started, uh, is what we do in the research lab oftentimes has multiple components, looks really cool, sexy, all these different parts. But when you think about how to translate those technologies towards the clinic, uh, oftentimes the FDA looks for simplicity. Uh, you need to benchmark your cells, your techniques, your materials. Uh, they need to be GMP produced or what have you. So thinking about the end in mind, we tend to uh, change or simplify our design principles uh, in, in, in making these products. So with that primer, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the work that we actually do in the lab and our platform technologies that we're trying to translate. Uh, so as the uh, title of the talk suggests, we employ self-assembly or aggregation, coacervation, things that come together on their own, self-assembly, to make hydrogels. And these hydrogels intrinsically, because of their nanofiber structure, their bioactivity, behave as mimics of growth factors, as tissue mimics to guide tissue regeneration. Uh, we've been fascinated by the tissue engineering paradigm, cells, scaffolds, signals, uh, and we've also been um, aware that a lot of cell transplants have challenges with viability and vitality. Uh, a lot of uh, tissue engineered products have xenogenic concerns or what have you. So in our lab, we try to incorporate signaling domains onto these scaffolds themselves. And we try to ensure the scaffolds principally are non-immunogenic, don't elicit um, adverse immune reactions or un <clears throat> untoward immune reactions. I think everything experiences an immune reaction, so to speak. So if I can draw your attention to the center of this screen, you see the little cartoon, those little peptides coming together. Uh, this is the general idea of the self-assembly that we employ. We synthesize these short peptides, which have these green bioactive domains on the end. And in aqueous solution, the black environment around it, in aqueous solution, we see through molecular dynamic simulations, uh, minimization, um, that basically these form anti-parallel beta sheets that extend into long range fibers. And when you add phosphate ions, those little yellow balls you just saw animated, they form these nanofibers, entangled networks and hydrogels. So as I mentioned before, these peptides are amphiphilic, they have a hydrophilic, hydrophobic phase, and we can conjugate different bioactive domains. Now, specific to bioactive domains, we've incorporated a domain from vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF165, the domain specifically called QK. We attach that to our self-assembling peptide. And now these fibers are intrinsically angiogenic. We inject them into specific tissue spaces and they cause the infiltration of cells and the development of robust vasculature, mature vasculature, alpha SMA line, CD31 line vasculature. And we're trying to translate that towards um, utility in peripheral artery disease, which is the video you see on the left over there. The idea being microvasculature, microvascular regeneration in ischemic tissue or low blood flow tissue can help better perfuse the tissue, helping the muscle regenerate. Now, we've made angiogenic versions. So the obvious question is, can you make an anti-angiogenic version? And one of the debilitating diseases out there that affects a lot of people above the age of 50 or 60, 55 or 60, is wet age-related macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. Both of these diseases cause ischemia on the back of the eye, on the retina, and that causes a lot of VEGF secretion, a lot of blood vessels grow. Currently, this is managed by monthly injections into the eye. So we ask that of an anti-angiogenic drug to kill the blood vessels so you can still see. We asked a simple question, what if we could, in, what if we could engineer a hydrogel because of self-assembly that is intrinsically anti-angiogenic, that releases peptides that are anti-angiogenic over month-long periods? And we've got some traction over there. Uh, extending this idea, we put on neurogenic domains, which is what you see on the right, evaluate in a traumatic brain injury model, as well as antimicrobial domains, which is what you see in the top, uh, that are intrinsic, that afford these materials intrinsic antimicrobial properties. So using these different techniques, uh, we really like this platform, as you will hear today, this platform of self-assembly and modification. And we've obtained a decent amount of funding from the NIH, from NSF, a number of different organizations. And we've started to translate these technologies. For example, Nangiotex, uh, Nano Angio Technologies, a portmanteau of that, uh, focuses on taking these peptides 
and trying to translate them towards dental pulp regeneration, which I'll talk about later, specifically for revascularization or new blood vessel growth. Our next startup, Safetex. Safetex is interested, well, was interested in the anti-angiogenic drug I told you about, but they recently pivoted, we recently pivoted towards COVID. And I'll tell you about one of our COVID therapeutics and what we're trying to do in that space. Um, as Human was trying to get to a little earlier on, uh, we're engineers. We look for problems and we try to solve them. One of the other startups that we have that is in a completely different space is called Pull Up. Pull Up is interesting in helping people park, uh, which you know we can talk about at a different time. <laughs> um, so here's the lab. Uh, I we, we love collaborating, as you will see uh, in, in the subsequent slides. A lot of the work that we do is highly collaborative. Um, we were a pretty decently sized group. We've got a good number of five or six, five graduate students, a postdoc, numerous undergraduate students, and JIT loves our undergrads. Um, please do visit our lab website, kumarlab.njit.edu, for more information, or feel free to reach out to me at vak at njit.edu. So <clears throat> back to the meat of the presentation. So our lab focuses on understanding drug discovery and delivery, tissue engineering, and translation. Now, while these might seem sequential as opposed or, or, or maybe not overlapping in a Venn diagram, we think that it's important to take the translational questions that are required to move products towards human trials and incorporate them even into the initial design as well as delivery of small molecules and the lessons which we can learn for tissue engineering applications, which is kind of what it says there. Specific to this, we've looked at a number of different applications for these self-assembling peptides and a couple of other technologies interested in developing new drugs, tissue engineering, and translation. Now, just as a side note, because these peptides, uh, which is what you see here, because these peptides are composed of synthetic amino, uh, well, synthetically produced amino acids in that they're L amino acids, and we produce these polypeptides through a synthetic procedure, solid phase peptide synthesis versus expression. And because they activate a specific cell receptor, they're classified as a drug and not a biologic or a medical device. Sure, they form scaffolds, sure, they're peptide based, but because they're made synthetically using a synthesizer, and because they, therefore, they're a drug and not a biologic, and because they activate receptors as opposed to just providing scaffolding, they are considered a drug over a device or a biologic. So very quickly, just some, a very little bit of chemistry to just orient everyone. These peptides conventionally, typically, canonically, have termini, have ends, which are charged, in this case, lysine residues. The mid-block of the peptide consists of alternating serine and leucine hydrophilic, hydrophobic amino acid residues. And what that allows is phase separation into a hydrophilic phase and a hydrophobic phase. What's interesting is that there are numerous peptide sequences out there. It's proteins everywhere, right? Uh, enzyme um, and what have you, that we can take short domains, mimics, and attach them onto our peptide sequence So for, without affecting self-assembly. For example, we can take a LRG, leucine arginine glycine uh, domain, which is cleaved by MMP2, matrix metalloproteinase 2, and we can incorporate that to the mid, in, into the mid-block of these peptides. So now when these peptides self-assemble into these fibers, you can have enzymes that come in and biodegrade them in, 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 in vivo. In addition, to, well, notwithstanding, these are peptides, so and enzymes and proteases are somewhat uh, promiscuous, so these peptides do degrade uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, even without this degradation sequence, but we can accelerate it with the addition of degradation sequences. In addition to that, what my lab has done a lot of <laughs> is modify the backbone. So we have a self-assembling backbone, backbone, is to modify the terminus, the terminus of this uh, peptide with different bioactive sequences. One of which, as you see here, is RGDS, derived from fibronectin to help with cell adhesion. But we'll put on other domains, such as an angiogenic domain, neurogenic domain, uh, and, and others. So very quickly, just to understand the self-assembly of these peptides, in aqueous solution, it forms a hydrophilic phase because of the serines and a hydrophobic phase because of the leucines, R groups. And of course, the bioactive domains that form on the termini assemble into the canonical secondary structures. In aqueous solution, because of that hydrophobic phase, 
what we see is that the hydrophobic regions come together in form of a sandwich, a hydrophobic sandwich. More and more multimers come together and using circular dichroism and Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FDIR, we can see that these form anti-parallel beta sheets. Now, what's interesting, if you remember, is that I mentioned there's a net positive charge buildup because of those lysines on the termini of these peptides right here. And what happens is that when the next peptide strand comes in to attach to these multimers, it gets repelled because there's so much net positive charge that the positive charge on this peptide gets repelled. And we call that molecular frustration. Basically, without the addition of salts, we see these multimers form. And with the addition of salts, what happens, especially multivalent salts like phosphate, PO4, 3 minus with multiple charges, it shields those ionic charges of the lysines and allows long range fiber growth and tangling of these fibers into ultimately a hydrogel. <clears throat> so critical point dried samples of these peptide hydrogels show a nanofibrous morphology. We can do atomic force microscopy, which I'll show you later. And more recently, we're looking at transmission electron microscopy and specifically cryo-EM to understand not just how these self-assemble in 2.5D, two dimensions and extended, but also whether there is a twist in these nanofibers. We'll start a collaboration with Peter Crow over at uh, University of Illinois Chicago, as well as uh, Venkatar Prasad over at uh, Baylor College of Medicine to look at not just the computational self-assembly, but also to do cryo-EM and try to relate these different aspects. We're also trying to get into NMR to understand what these different uh, peptides and how they relate to each other and their molecular spacing. Anyway, what's important in all the stuff that I just told you, assuming you have no background or don't care for the chemistry, is the fact that, is the fact that they're held together by non-covalent bonds, bonds that are not very strong which means that these peptides in aqueous solution can be syringe, these hydrogels can be syringe aspirated because the bonds break easily and injected. And once it's injected in situ as a bolus, it re-self assembles almost instantaneously, getting its G prime within 99% of its G prime within a couple of seconds. What this means is that now you have a localized bolus where you could deliver drugs, as I mentioned, aqueous formulation, deliver cells as we've done, or even functionalize the peptide to have a prolonged angiogenic, anti-angiogenic, neurogenic, or localized growth factor response in that region. So we think this is a really cool uh, technology and really nice platform to build upon. Uh, we've got some decent traction on it. And as I mentioned, we use this platform to address, to address three different aspects in, uh, in the biomedical sciences. So I want to give you a quick vignette, a quick, um, I guess, uh, understanding of some of these different projects that we have going on in the lab. So the first project that I'd like to talk about is an enzyme binding domain that we attach to the self-assembling peptides. I told you we can attach growth factor mimics. What we decided to do here was to attach a domain that binds to PCSK9. So anybody in the, anyone who is taking statins or anyone who has some uh, background in the cholesterol uh, metabolic sciences, would understand that PCSK9 inhibitors plummet cholesterol levels. They drop cholesterol levels much better than statins do. But one of the challenges with PCSK9 inhibitors is that Regeneron's monoclonal antibodies for it cost a lot of money. And they're hard to synthesize, they're hard to develop. So Genentech a couple of years ago said, well, can we make a peptide that inhibits PCSK9? Unfortunately, their peptide had decent efficacy, but did not uh, in vitro, but was not stable. So what we said was, what if we took that sequence, attached it to our self-assembling peptide, and saw whether we got improved stability as well as improved pharmacologic effect, both in vitro and in vivo. And what we saw, and I'll get more into this in the next slide, is that while stability may be about the same, they're peptides, uh, at least in vivo, what we saw was that we have binding to PCSK9, this enzyme, we have binding of our peptides to this enzyme and self-assembly on top of the enzyme. And I'll tell you more about that on the next slide. One of the other aspects in this platform that we've been very excited about, and my, my first grad PhD student is working on still, is the development of anti-inflammatory peptides. What we do here, I told you about how we can attach growth factor mimics, I told you about how we can attach domains that bind enzymes, what we attach here is the domain that binds a cytokine. So derived from 
Uh, CCR2, the, the receptor for MCP1, monocyte chemotrypin protein 1, we took a piece of that receptor and we attached it to our peptides and these self-assemble to a hydrogel. Now these hydrogels chelate or hold on to MCP1, monocyte chemotrypin protein 1. And we've tested these both in vitro using a chemotaxis assay showing that we can chelate MCP1, decreasing macrophage chemotaxis, and in vivo where we show that these hydrogels which typically infiltrate with a lot of immune cells, don't uh, have much less cell infiltration without getting into too much detail. I told you about our uh, anti-angiogenic um, therapeutics. Uh, I told you about our angiogenic therapeutics. And what we do on the anti-angiogenic side is that instead of taking domains that, oh, well, or rather, we took a domain that promotes apoptosis of proliferating endothelial cells. So it's basically a GRP78 inhibitor. It binds to proliferating endothelial cells and helps uh, their apoptosis. So essentially, in these rapidly proliferating uh, blood vessels, which may or may not, uh, which may be leaky, uh, cause edema, or what have you, uh, we can inject these hydrogels and restrict the amount of blood vessels that form. So coming back to the PCSK9 story, maybe I should have gone in the reverse order just to continue the story. Uh, coming back to the PCSK9 story, and what we've been trying to do for all our peptides now is surface plasmon resonance. The technique is relatively simple. You have a gold chip, or you have a chip where you immobilize a ligand. You, you immobilize an enzyme, in this case, PCSK9, and you flow your analyte on top. And in this case, we see that our peptides bind and self-assemble. Let me just walk you through that very quickly. We mobilize PCSK9, an enzyme, onto this gold substrate. We then show that the control, the peptide that Genentech made, PEP2A, that peptide, it binds. And when you stop flowing their peptide, it, un it unbinds. There's an on kinetics, there's an off kinetics. You get a KD. What we see with our peptides is that after they bind, which is what you kind of see here, they self-assemble. So they are binding not just to the active site in, in the one-to-one -one ratio of peptide, active site to receptor, they're binding and they're self-assembling on top of the receptor and they have super stoichiometric binding. So instead of one-to-one -one ligand receptor binding, we see 17, 20 to one peptide to, uh, in this case, PCSK9 binding. And we've seen this with a variety of other peptides as well, including our angiogenic peptides. Um, and we're trying to investigate that for our anti-inflammatory peptides as well. <coughs> So then the question is, who cares, right? So, so what? You can bind a target and self-assemble on a target. Who cares? Well, one of the reasons why we might care is that prolonged and um, uh, concentrated receptor signaling may promote different phenotype or might promote long-term signaling. In addition to that, we can potentially reduce drug, drug dosing. What we saw in this study is high specificity for a target but also self-assembly on top of that target. So instead of having non-target side effects for an IV therapeutic, for example, we can have binding and then self-assembly on top of these uh, antigenic targets or on top of these different uh, targets. And that's one of the strategies that we utilize for the work that we do in SafeTex, for example, where we're trying to develop COVID-based thera therapeutics against SARS-CoV-2, uh, which I'll tell you at, uh, about at the end of this. So some of the recent work that we've done in terms of drug and cell delivery, as I mentioned, these are aqueously formulated hydrogels. And if it's water, you can load, cell, well, buffer, you can load cells, you can load proteins, you can load growth factors, cytokines, chemokines, you name it. Um, we took OxoM and PPBP, these two small molecules, along with our collaborator Chang Li over at Columbia, and we released them from our hydrogels. And what Chang showed was that in a rabbit temporal mandibular joint uh, defect model that we can regenerate cartilage by slow release or attenuated release of different um, small molecules in the uh, uh, craniofacial space. What's also important is that these materials are biodegradable. When you inject them under the skin or into the muscle, into the eye, into the tooth, intravenously, when you inject them into different boluses, bolus spaces, well, what we see is that within three to seven days, they rapidly infiltrate with cells. Within 14 days, they're, bio, they're biodegrading, they've decreased in volume, and within 28 days, they're gone. Right? And obviously, that depends on the volume that you inject, the concentration, things like that. But in general, we've seen that these 
biodegradable hydrogels persist in the tissue for about three to four weeks compared to a similar sized bolus of pure matrix, matrix um, what is this, RADA, right? Another beta sheet uh, forming hydrogel, which sticks around for maybe, maybe a week or so, if that. Um, so in addition to cartilage regeneration, one of the things that we recently published last year was a naloxone drug delivery. Um, you know, with COVID, with opioid epidemic, with all these different things, we and the funding that, that NIH gives out for opioid research, uh, we thought that our hydrogels may provide long-term release of naloxone. So without getting too much into the story of naloxone, Naloxone is given when someone ODs on heroin, right? So they OD, they go into respiratory suppression. Naloxone is given so that they start breathing again. Now, the problem with naloxone is that it competitively binds to the mu uh, opioid receptor, the same receptor the heroin binds to, except it binds better and stronger. So these people, uh, 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 these, subs these folks with substance use disorders um, go into precipitated withdrawal. They get out of being... Uh, intoxicated, so to speak, um, and immediately become uh, very agitated and go to go into what's known as precipitated withdrawal, um, where there are cravings, they rip IV lines out, they leave the hospital against medical advice or what have you. The problem there is that the dose of naloxone is too high. You're trying to get respiratory uh, recovery, uh, respiration recovery, but the dose is too high. On the flip side of this, two weeks later, if the person is not using, right, uh, abusing drugs, um, they can get into uh, naltrexone, all long-term release naloxone formulations, a slightly different molecule for addiction recovery. But the space between 75 minutes, the half-life of naloxone, and two weeks is unaddressed. And what we said was, what if we can make a hydrogel, which is what we show in the preliminary data in the top right here, at uh, top left here, what if we can make a hydrogel that releases naloxone over a seven to 14 day period that bridges this acute recovery and prevents precipitated withdrawal all the way out to um, uh, 14 days <clears throat> until they can, uh, the patients can get onto uh, naltrexone. Anyway, if, if people are more interested in this, uh, there is a buprenorphine component to this, which I didn't talk about. I'd love to talk more about this later as well. The neat thing about this, as I mentioned before, is that these are gels. As you look in the middle of this slide in B, these are gels. And these gels are nanopores, but the, they're, the peptide fibers are highly mo mobile. They're highly flexible because they're non-covalently linked. So we asked a simple question. If we can aspirate this with a pipetter, let's try this with cells. <laughs> so we put on, um, what did we do? We loaded mouse embryonic stem cells as well as induced pluripotent stem cells into these hydrogels. We published an initial paper where we looked at reconstitution, just randomly homogeneous um, reconstitution of mouse embryonic stem cells within our hydrogels. And what we showed in this figure that you see on the top right is that these randomly distributed cells started to form these clusters over a four-week period, and they maintain their pluripotent phenotype through PCR, which is what you see in the bottom left. What's also neat about this is we took these cell fluorescently labeled cell loaded constructs and we wrote out NJIT in a petri dish which is what you see in the lower right pictures and we did scanning electron microscopy to show viability of cells and this is at three days uh, the image in A at the bottom right we can show viability of cells and maintenance and maintenance of an architecture uh, of the loaded cells so we're trying to progress this we just recently got a, a New Jersey no, it's so NCATS. It's like a, a we, we just got a grant uh, which looks at loading these uh, dif uh, cardiomyocytes, sorry, loading these embryonic stem cells which are differentiated towards cardiomyocytes, either embryonic stem cells, mouse, or induced pluripotent stem cells towards cardiomyocytes and then injecting them with our hydrogels into MI defects, myocardial infarction defects, to see whether we can get myocardial uh, tissue regeneration. So, one of the things that we see when we load cells or when we implant these hydrogels and the cells infiltrate into these hydrogels is that they is that instead of forming a fibrous capsule which is oftentimes what you see with uh, other medical devices that are implanted other hydrogels or what have you we see rapid infiltration of cells into these hydrogels and if we look through transmission electron microscopy essentially sacrifice the animal take out the hydrogel embed it in epinate or resin section it image using TEM, transmission electron microscopy. What we see in A 
is that there are cells, if you can follow the plasma membrane and then the top part of the cell zoomed in in B, there are cells which are infiltrating these hydrogels that are forming these invaginations and phagocytosing the hydrogels. Show them with the hashtag, because, right? Show them with the hashtag here, uh, these filamentous peptides, which are being phagocytosed in these invaginations in cells and being degraded, as you can see in C, in intercellular vacuoles. What's also neat about this, coming back to A, you can see the hydrogel, the nanofibrous hydrogel with the hashtag. What you can also see is native collagen that's being deposited, right? So the cells that are infiltrating these hydrogels are not only biodegrading, phagocytosine degrading, biodegrading these peptides, but they're also depositing their own collagen, re regenerating, repopulating this, these scaffolds with native matrix. So that led us to ask some fundamental questions in, can we use these scaffolds that are bioactive, that are biocompatible, that allow good cell infiltration, can we use, and that biodegrade, can we use these scaffolds for tissue mimicry? Can we mimic different tissues in different organs? One of the first questions we asked here was, can we mimic vascular endothelial growth factor? Now, this, we've gotten a lot of traction by doing this. We took a domain called QK, attached it to our self-assembling peptides. And what we showed through a series of publications and, and, and funding is the ability to revascularize. Take these hydrogels, inject them either in biodegradable scaffolds, inject them in the teeth, inject them in the eye, and in a number of different tissue spaces, and cause regeneration of blood vessels. And I'll tell you more about that on the next slide. Um, but very quickly, in terms of antimicrobial scaffolds, I just want to make sure we're good on time, which we are. Okay. In terms of antimicrobial scaffolds, what we did there was to take our same scaffold. Right? And I told you the ends of our scaffolds have lysines. And if you remember from, I don't know, grade school, polylysine, multiple lysines are antibacterial. So we asked a simple question. What if we took our scaffold, which has lysines on the termini, and increased them from one or two to four to six to eight lysines on each side, right? These cationic self-assembling peptides. Lysines is, uh, is positively charged. So these CASPs are cationic uh, self-assembling peptides, CASPs. What we, show, what we saw was that when you have six lysines on each side, they still form hydrogels, but when we plate them on a variety of different bacteria, they annihilate the bacterial biofilm of the bacterial lawn while still maintaining viability of mammalian cells. And we saw that two or four lysines didn't have as much antibacterial effect, which is what you see in these spot assays in the bottom left, and eight lysines on each side while having good antimicrobial effect wasn't a very good hydrogel. Uh, and what we're trying to do with these hydrogels is to use them for infected wound healing. Um, right. So the next thing that we've worked on in terms of tissue mimicry, or one of the other things we've worked on in terms of tissue mimicry is the addition of <coughs> neurogenic scaffolds or neurogenic domains. We took a neuroprotective domain called ependymin, which binds glutamate, reduces glutamate, induced cytotoxicity. We attached it to our self-assembling peptides and we did a fluid percussion injury we did a craniotomy, fluid jet on the cranium of a rat, injected our peptides, and what we saw was that we decreased the amount of damage. Uh, we didn't do uh, functional readouts uh, like rotor rod or what have you, so that's the next study we're planning on doing. But histologically, what we showed was we had the deployment of the angiogenic hydrogel, we had, uh, well, rather, neurogenic hydrogel, regeneration of blood vessels, as well as preservation of neural phenotype, as well as preservation of neurons. Uh, and uh, we published that um, last year. <clears throat> so coming back to the angiogenic scaffolds, because we've got a lot of traction on that, can tell more stories about that. <laughs> uh, we've got the self-assembling domain, and you've heard this several times today, so it should come as no surprise, self-assembling domain. And we know that the self-assembling domain forms a fiber, right? It stacks together a beta sheet uh, and then forms a long fiber. What I also told you was we attach different bioactive domains. What you see specifically here is called QK. It is a 15 amino acid mimic of vascular endothelial growth factor, this large 25 kilodalton protein. There is a small 15 amino acid peptide which mimics the active site of the growth factor. We took that domain, we attached it to our peptides, and now when these self-assembling peptides self-assemble, you see constitutive uh, representation or, or uh, presentation rather of these angiogenic domains on the termina of these peptides. Long story short, these fibers are highly angiogenic. 
And we showed that not just by binding to endothelial cells and fact sorting, we can make them fluorescent. But if you look at the image on the top right, these hydrogels went implanted in the subcutaneous space. If you follow my cursor, this purple region here, down to the bottom right, is acellular hydrogel, seven days later in a rodent model, that had rapidly infiltrated with cells. You can see it's chock full of cells, those blue dappy stained nuclei. What you also see is that there are numerous parasites stained in purple, as well as endothelial cells stained in green, and most importantly, smooth muscle cells stained by alpha SMA in red. So we know that the vessels that are infiltrating, you can see all those red circles and maybe even that oblique section of a vessel infiltrating into these hydrogels. We see that these vessels that are infiltrating into the hydrogels are not just nascent capillaries, leaky, immature capillaries. They're mature alpha SMA lined blood vessels, right? They're arterioles, venules, 15 to 50 micron diameter sized venules uh, or arterioles. So that was great. <laughs> We tried a mouse Heinlein ischemia model. So coming back to some of the translational challenges, we tried a mouse Heinlein ischemia model where we ligated the femoral artery in a mouse and uh, we injected our peptide proximal and distal to the ligature. We showed beautiful regeneration of vasculature, got that published in ACS Nano back in 2015, uh, 2016. Um, well, the first description of this was in ACS Nano, the Heinlein ischemia was in biomaterials. Not the point, the point is, we did the study, we showed preclinical efficacy for peripheral artery disease, but the biggest challenge is that what happens in a small animal, microvascular regeneration, this animal is model specific, microvascular regeneration is sufficient. If you can create a small 100, 200 micron vessel or a bunch of smaller vessels, it reperfuses the ischemic tissue great. However, in a human, the arthrosclerosis that we face is much larger. If you lig ligate the femoral in a human, an adult especially, you're going to have the leg fall off, right? There's not going to be enough perfusion. These are large blood vessels, millimeter-sized blood vessels in the human, and therefore the model doesn't exactly uh, represent what happens in the human condition. Now, there are other models of hind limb ischemia in higher animal models. Um, there is no good consensus model, uh, which fully recapitulates the atherosclerosis, the ischemia, the hypoxia. Uh, I mean, at best, we can use aged um, non-human primate models, but again, there are challenges with that. So coming back to it, we have an angiogenic hydrogel, we have decent animal efficacy, but we still don't have a great, great target to um, translate this in, in, in towards humans. Now, a number of other companies and a number of other labs or what have you have tried using, I say companies because we've tried pitching this, which is why I know, um, have tried taking their growth factors, stem cells, chemokines, what have you, towards the clinic with just mouse data. And they've been funded back in the 90s, HIF-1 Alpha, uh, what have you, uh, PLGF, uh, and 2000s. But one of the biggest challenges is those results don't translate. And one of the reasons we think those results don't translate is partly because of the size mismatch. Femoral in a human is four millimeters or six millimeters compared to a couple of hundred microns, if that, in a mouse. And in addition to that, we think that a number of the factors that are injected diffuse away very rapidly. So while in a mouse, that initial, I don't know, three to five days that you have some localized response of a growth factor may be sufficient to kickstart, jumpstart, provide enough recovery. In humans, we envision, we imagine that you need much longer pre localized presentation of a growth factor stimulus. So to that end, long story short, we asked the question, is there a tissue space in a large animal model or human where microvascular regeneration would be useful? And one of the first things that came to our mind, uh, it was dental pulp regeneration. Now, if you think about the dental pulp, or specifically, if you think about tooth pain, that's because the soft tissue in your tooth is inflamed. It's infected, it's inflamed, it throbs, it hurts. You go to the dentist, they go there, they uh, extirpate, they remove all the soft tissue and they put in rubber rods, got a percha. The problem with rubber rods, especially in younger populations where the tooth is still developing, right? The root is still developing, the walls. The, the problem with gutta percha or rubber rods is that it's bio-inactive. <laughs> it leaves the tooth 
non-responsive to future insult. It may result in the walls of the tooth, the enamel or the dentin to resorb, and doesn't provide um, innervation, vascularization, or sensation. You're left with a dead tooth after a root canal, conventionally. So what we said was, and, and what a number of other folks have tried to do in dental pulp regeneration, regenerating the soft tissue in the tooth, is to use stem cells, growth factors, uh, bone marrow derived stem cells, uh, pulp transfers from one tooth to, to the other, which are expensive. And I think the last thing that I want when I need a root canal, when I go to the dentist in pain, is the dentist to say, hey, look, I'm gonna go to, go to your iliac crest and do a bone marrow aspirin. Doesn't really make sense. We asked a simple question. Can we use our angiogenic hydrogel, which is an off the shelf material, right? Inject that directly into the tooth and promote dental pulp revascularization or dental pulp regeneration. And we did this, the problem with mice is that because they're mice and rats, they lose teeth or they're, they're, any injury rapidly regrows. We tried this in a canine model. We tried this in, a, in an adult beagle model where we did full root canals and the incisors and premolars. We injected our hydrogel and within 28 days, we saw beautiful tissue regeneration from the apex of the bottom of the tooth that goes into the jaw all the way to the crown, the top, the top of the tooth, right? Um, and just to orient you very quickly, so this is what a tooth typically looks like. The outside is enamel. Below the gum line, it's called cementum. Uh, below the enamel is the dentin, that, which is still hard tissue, but that interacts with the soft tissue dental pulp underneath. The dental pulp has, these, has cells which have protrusions into the dentin, supplying the dentin uh, and helping it calcify uh, and, and develop, right? Because this is the outer structure of the tooth. We removed all the dental pulp, we injected our hydrogel, and within 28 days, you see this very nice tissue regeneration. So uh, let's start at C. What you see in the light pink is the dentin, which surrounds the pulp cavity, the, 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 the root, essentially, the canal. We injected our hydrogels, and within 28 days, you see that from the apex, where the asterisk is that goes into your jaw, there was very nice tissue regeneration all the way up to the crown. Um, and if we look a little bit more closely at the different regions, we see that the tissue is aligned. This is H and E stain. The tissue is aligned in the direction of the, uh, of the canal. We also see these large blood vessels carrying numerous red blood cells, um, which grow from the apex towards the crown. In addition to that, we see this dense odontoblast-like layer, this dense layer of cells right next to the dentin. Remember I told you how the cells have these protrusions in the dentin to stabilize it? We see that here as well. So the long, even longer story short, we injected a hydrogel, material only, that promoted regeneration of vascularized tissue within the pulp canal. And we recently just published all of this in Active Biomateria via. We immunostain for tissue, and you can kind of see it better with Mason's trichrome staining. I'll take you through the bottom row here. We, we, we did some Mason's trichrome staining and we very clearly saw, and these are just magnified from left to right, we very clearly saw regeneration of collagen, right, in light blue, these large blood vessels carrying numerous red blood cells. In addition to that, these nerve bundles, as you can see in the in circle in the lower right image. Now in the upper image, we stain for dental siloprotein. So if the cells going in there are differentiating towards a odontoblast phenotype, they should express dental siloprotein, right? The type of cells that are in there uh, or should be in there. Now, what we saw when we stained for dental siloprotein was that not only did we have that dense odontoblast-like layer right in apposition with the dentin, right next to the dentin, but we also had these finger-like protrusions into the dentin from these cells, which is what is encircled in the top right image. So we're very excited about this. We're writing a grant to try uh, longer time, longer end time points uh, out to six months, uh, as well as to use CT to look at the thickening or, or strengthening of the root itself. So I told you how we can take these hydrogels. We can inject them under the skin, a lot of vasculature. We can inject them into the tooth, good tissue regeneration and vasculature. But the next question is, can we take a relatively large implant? By relatively large, I mean like a sponge, a biodegradable sponge, as we show in this image here. Can we take something that is on the order of centimeters, right? And infiltrate our angiogenic hydrogel to see whether we can 
in vivo revascularize biodegradable implants. And we think that's, we think that's a tall order. We were very excited about that. So to, to prove this, we took a biodegradable scaffold, polyoctane dial citrate. Uh, this was pioneered by uh, Guillermo Amir over at Northwestern, along with Jan Yang, who's now at, at Penn State. Uh, what they have done, as well as Antonio Webb's at University of Florida, um, what they have done is they've created these polyoctane dial citrate, POC scaffolds, which have micro pores, right? So you can see uh, the person's hand holding tweezers, holding a uh, I'm guessing that's a tube, oops, uh, a tube of the material. Now, if we look at the scanning electron microscopy, SCM micrographs of the ultrastructure, we can see that these salt leached pores, we use salt to create a micropore structure, these salt leached pores are interconnecting, they're about 100 to 250 microns, 100 to 200 microns in diameter, and they're highly interconnected. We took the scaffold, we centrifuged in our hydrogels, and within uh, and what we saw was the nanofiber structure of our hydrogels within the pores of this biomaterial. We made an incision on the backs of rats, implanted this under the skin, and that's kind of what you see here. If you follow along in A, you see the hair follicles on the top of the skin, you see the subcut you see the muscle in the skin and the subcutaneous implant. And this is the implant right here. Um, Looking at a cross-section of the implant, again, in B through F, we see that the PBS-soaked implants, just saline-soaked implants, had very little tissue infiltration. However, when we, loaded the R, when we loaded these polymeric scaffolds with our hydrogels, we had very rapid tissue infiltration into all those pores which contained the hydrogel. Within 28 days, and this was in a rodent, we saw that several hundred microns, several millimeters, in fact, uh, into these scaffolds, had uh, tissue grown in, blood vessels grown in, and collagen deposition. So this is Mason's trichrome staining, the light blue, the light blue staining for collagen, along with these multi-lamel, multi-walled, multi-cell walled uh, vessels, which contain multiple red blood cells, suggesting that we're regenerating mature uh, micro vessels, arterioles, venules, which are infiltrating into these scaffolds at, in stark contrast to the PBS cell controls. So we're very excited about this. We just got this uh, ex uh, uh, published. Uh, I was going to say accepted, but it's published now in Chemical Engineering Journal. Um, so yeah, so I've told you about how we can use these technologies to make novel drugs, cell, uh, cell delivery, drug delivery, uh, scaffolds, and even tissue mimicry. But then at, uh, what is this, April of last year, or maybe March of last year, COVID happened. And <laughs> And that changed everything, because if you're not doing COVID research, you can't go in, right? Or you couldn't go in for a couple months. So we said, of course we're doing COVID research. We came up with a new idea. We said, look, viruses, uh, coronavirus has spike on its surface. And through computational design, there are numerous groups, including ours, who have made peptides that bind to spike protein. The problem with peptides, I told you about this before, and I'll tell you again, the problem with peptides is that, is that they're unstable and they bind and they let go. What if we could make a peptide that would bind, not let go, but self-assemble on top of the virus, right? So we came up with this idea of epiviral self-assembly, wherein we take a binding domain that binds to SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike, we attach a self-assembling domain, and we show that it, and what we want to show rather, is that it binds and self-assembles on top of the virus. Now I showed you in the TEM images earlier that um, our nanofibers get phagocytosed. So our hope is that these opsonized or coded viruses get phagocytosed by the cell and degraded within the cell. And if they are degraded within the cell in vacuoles, potentially they get loaded onto MHC and help with vaccine uh, and help with antibody development by the body. In addition to that, at the very least, we suspect that binding to the uh, spike, binding to spike can inhibit binding to ACE2 on a cell surface, preventing um, in, uh, entry of the virus into cells. So here is a very brief video because, you know, it says it a lot better than I can. So we know the coronavirus has spike proteins that bind to ACE2 and that it infect cells. Uh, what we're trying to do with our self-assembling peptide approach is to use these peptides that bind to spike and self-assemble on top of spike preventing the coronavirus from binding or interacting with ACE2 and therefore decreasing viral load. 
So um, turns out it's actually extremely hard to do this. <laughs> Uh, it turns out it's actually very hard to do in vivo studies for this, uh, even in vitro, because everything is BSL-3 uh, or what have you. Uh, fortunately, we have a collaborator at the Rutgers School of Public Health, as well as Cornell um, Medical School, um, who are helping us with some of the in vitro and in vivo work. We've demonstrated so far that with pseudovirus and live virus titers, that in a dose-dependent fashion, we can decrease infectivity of live virus into uh, mammalian cells. Um, and you, as you can see, some of this is redacted because we're, it's IP protected as well as uh, uh, you know, trying to raise money for this with safe text. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of this work, I'm sure I'm missing a number of different people here, but a lot of this work was highly, highly collaborative. We are a material synthesis lab. We ask very basic questions, but we work with extremely smart individuals, experts in their field to address and understand these materials and this platform better towards translation. The last thing that I'd like to tell you about is what we're hoping to do in the future. Um, I am not a computational, don't tell the reviewers, <laughs> I am not a computational chemist, I'm not a computational designer by training. However, over the past couple of years, what we have realized is that we can take these domains that other people have published in PNAS or Nature or what have you, we can take these domains that people have isolated from existing growth factors, cytokines, chemokines, or we can take known receptors, known targets, and computationally design peptides that bind to these targets. It's, a, it's been a phenomenal and extremely exciting past couple of years as we have tried to get into computationally rationalized design of these peptides. What's really neat, what's really exciting about this is that not only are we designing new peptides because of the computational power we have now, of course, graphic cards are expensive because of Bitcoin mining, but different story. Um, we, we did buy a computer, very pricey. Um, but because of computational power to date, we're able to design different peptides and with our self-assembling platform, create new drugs that might be able to target a number of different uh, receptors. So in, in addition to uh, spike that I told you about just now, we're also targeting NSP3, NSP4 in the COVID space, Sigma2 in the uh, opioid space, uh, as well as uh, MCP1, CCR2 in the anti-inflammatory space. So with that, I thank you all very much. Uh, I think my hiccups are gone, fortunately. <laughs> Good thing this recorded. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is right there. Uh, obviously, this picture was pre-COVID. Uh, everyone here has... Uh, Put on a mask. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumar, for your very uh, interesting and uh, uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, so, uh, so I encourage the uh, the audience to ask their questions in the ask a question box. Uh, you can also share your thoughts with uh, with our speaker uh, in the chat panel. Uh, so, uh, before we uh, start asking questions from, from Dr. Kumar, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to announce that uh, we have uh, 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 the next speaker that we have le next uh, week will be uh, Dr. Nureddin uh, Ashamahi. Uh, uh, so, please make sure that you follow us on uh, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn to, uh, uh, for more information about the, how to, uh, we can participate in this uh, in the next talk. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start uh, the Q&A actually by asking a few questions about the shelf life of these self-assembled peptides. Uh, so how stable are they in terms of, you know, storing them in Freeze bridges. What is, what is it? What are the storing storage conditions? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, also, I have questions about their stability over time, and uh, also maybe uh, when when you sterilize them. So, uh, given that we synthesize these peptides, oh, I'm getting a little background. Um, so, given that we synthesize these peptides using solid phase peptide synthesis. Uh, most of the steps that we use involve organic solvents, so these materials are pretty sterile, so to speak. Uh, we, do do, we do do dialysis for purification uh, because HPLC just takes too much time and expensive. Uh, we do dialysis, and what we do there is um, after dialysis is uh, filtered through a 0.22 micron filter. So in that sense, they're sterile. 
In terms of stability, we've seen that peptides lyophilized are stable at room temperature, negative 80, negative 20, like whatever temperature for months, right? Like we, we, do, we do LCMS to measure, uh, to measure stability, and we see that they're stable for months. Um, in formulation, so when dissolved as a hydrogel, we've seen that the angiogenic peptide, at least, we've done some formal stability studies for that, that that degrades uh, about 5 or 10% in about a month to two at 37C. Uh, at 4C, it's stable for months. So we know that these pe peptides, because they self-assemble into beta sheets, have a, um, they don't disperse, they're, they're less susceptible to uh, degradation. Um, yeah. Okay, that's, that's fair. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the method that you, uh, to use to sterilize them is like by, uh, you, by, by filtration. Uh, making them, okay. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, so, uh, so, so I have another question about uh, the application of uh, these self-assembled peptide for drug delivery. I noticed that uh, uh, you've used it in multiple like applications. Uh, I wonder if 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 you can make them stimuli responsive, maybe like uh, pH responsive or temperature responsive. So, so when you inject them, you can either control the release rate, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. or deliver drugs on demand or in response to certain type of, you know. That, that, that's a great question. So um, these are shear responsive, right? So the thixotropic, the shear thinning, shear recovering, like like hand sanitizer, toothpaste, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, because the charges on the ends, on the termini of the peptides, we can put glutamic acids for negative charges, uh, lysine for positive charges. Because they are pH sensitive, when we change the pH, they either go completely into solution or they, uh, instead of staying a hydrogel, or they precipitate out of solution instead of staying a hydrogel. So mm. there is some uh, tuning that we can do on pH, uh, but we haven't explored that. So, so far we've, you know, been, we've taken very simple steps in just using pH 7, 7.4 7 buffer uh, to formulate these gels. Uh, but I mean, it's a great idea. We, we'd be interested in trying. <laughs> So you mentioned that uh, when 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 you make when you change the pH when you increase the pH they become like a liquid like so it, or no it, it depends on the so the peptide sequence has lysines or glutamic yeah. acids on the yeah. termini and that yeah. mid block of serine leucine repeats mm -hmm. so if you have lysines on the termini uh, at lower pHs uh, because of the higher ionic content in the in the salt in the solution there is a chance that they will not be protonated right so if they're not protonated the lysines then they will not be as soluble so these peptides these uh might start to precipitate out so if there was a hydrogel at neutral ph that had loaded drug or what have you at lower phs they might start to uh dissolve or disassemble uh allowing mm -hmm. release uh, but to be fair that's that's not something that we've explored uh specifically what we are doing i guess what i can say we are doing right now with respect to ph is that knowing that there's less assembly at lower pHs or, or very high pHs, 2, uh, 12, 10, what have you, is that we're doing NMR to understand self-assembly at different pHs. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that NMR at pH 7, you have a lot of fibers, they're really long. NMR at pH 2, you see more of a monomeric state. So mm -hmm. uh, we, I think going back to what you were saying, I think there is some pH tuning that we can try, but you know, just it's not done it yet. Okay. Okay, but do you know, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I know you've, uh, you haven't done this uh, in your lab, but do you know what range of pH uh, are we talking about? Is it like very acidic or very basic, or we're talking about maybe seven to six? Uh, right, right, right. So, so we are, our hydrogels are stable from at least pH five to about eight or nine. Uh, typically outside of that range, it starts to get tricky. And now yeah. here's another problem. Um, for anyone who works in this space, this is going to make a lot of sense. So one of the other problems that we have is that because you, when changing the pH, you are adding a lot of salt, yeah. salt interacts with these peptides. The higher the salt concentration, the more likely these peptides are not going to be soluble or, well, it, cha it changes the self-assembly of peptides. So, so um, uh, to answer your question, in the range of five to nine, it's relatively stable, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, great, great. Uh, so uh, uh, so self-assembled. Uh, so you mentioned that these self-assembled peptides uh, they form this fiber-like 
structures. So how long are these fibers? Uh, so we've done atomic force microscopy mm -hmm. uh, to understand the dimensions of the fibers. We know that the width of the fibers is somewhere around 10 nanometers. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, 10 nanometers. And the height of the fibers are somewhere around two to three uh, nanometers as well, which correlates to this idea of the two peptides stacking with each other because that's about 10 nanometers and that's about two nanometers in height. The problem is when we do molecular dynamic simulations, we don't see a fiber like, we don't see a fiber that's like a tape or a ribbon. We see a fiber that's like a fiber, like a rope, right? Like it's just, that, that, that has a twist, that has a pitch, as well as uh, we don't just see two principal axes, we just see one axis, right? Like a diameter as opposed to height and width. So what we're trying to do now is cryo-EM and uh, yeah, probably just cryo-EM to understand what is that twist and what the exact self-assembly is. Answering your question, in the AFM that we've done, in the SCM that we've done, it's very hard to measure fiber lengths because, uh, or persistence because um, they just entangle. They entangle, it's very hard to follow where one begins and the other ends. Uh, and even in AFM, it's, you know, it's slightly contrived because you're lowering the concentration and things like that. Uh, but, the, but we have measured fibers on the order of hundreds of nanometers, microns long. Um, yeah, but, but the width and the height is about 10 and two nanometers. Oh, I think you might need it, yeah. Yeah, can you? So in the gels that you make out of these uh, peptides, uh, I assume that these fibers are randomly oriented within the gel, right? Yes, yes. So, so uh, most of, uh, well, all the gels that we have made to date have had isot isotropic structures, have had no design anisotropy or, or alignment. Uh, I know work by Jeff Harkering, for example, at Rice University, they've looked at alignment using uh, dopamine, I think, dopamine uh, functionalized hydrogels and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, so we haven't specifically looked at alignment. Now, to be fair, one of the things that our gels completely suck at is load bearing applications, right? We're not mm -hmm. using this for bone tissue engineering, or we're not using this for bone tissue engineering as a scaffold support. We're using this, we actually have a grant that's going out soon to look at drug delivery or uh, small molecule delivery and things like that. We're not specifically looking at, at using these for structural support. Um, to that end, we're more interested in using other, uh, you know, electrospun technologies, fibers, biodegradable scaffolds that can ha allow mechanical strength as well as tissue guidance. Um, but in our case, we're primarily looking at isotropic hydrogels. Uh, and, and just to finish that thought, one of the reasons we're more interested in isotropic hydrogels is that they're injectable, right? Because it's hard to inject a, a line structure. Not impossible, harder. Uh, but in our mind, you know, especially when a clinician is using this, if it's just a simple injection, mm -hmm. it's not revolutionizing their world, you know? Yeah. Um. <laughs> but uh, my question is, uh, and I'll get to the audience, uh, the questions from the audience. Sorry, folks. I mean, I started asking questions uh, sooner and then uh, <laughs> I'm now <laughs> continuing these questions. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. So, but. Uh, so, so I assume that you're using like a 30 needle, maybe 30 gauge needle, right? Is, is that is that the size that you're using? Uh, so, do you see any effect on the uh, on the alignment of these fibers when you inject them through these through these tiny needles due no, to no. shear? No idea, no idea. Mm. So, what we do know is that the smaller the gauge size, so for the canine work, I believe we use a 30, maybe even slightly smaller, like maybe a 32. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But for the subcutaneous work, oftentimes we use a 25 or something yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we don't know. We don't know. Mm -hmm. One of the, so another challenge, and I'm you know, just t t telling you all our problems we have. One, another challenge that we have is um, when you inject or fabricate these gels, uh, we haven't tried lyophilization for imaging. Typically what we do is fix critical point dry and then image. So um, we haven't, it's, it's generally harder to do that with a, with a smaller construct. Um, mm. But I think, you know, one of the things that we're going to try doing soon is lyophilization. So make a hydrogel, maybe extrude it in the, in, in, in the way you're saying and see whether we have a preferential alignment. But mm -hmm. we haven't tried that. Yeah. Well, 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 thank you very much. Again, I mean, I mean, it's, uh, there are many, many different ideas that just, you know, came to my yeah, mind. And... Yeah. And then I was, uh, I'm very excited and very interested in, in, in this work. So let's go to uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is uh, about the purification. Uh, 
process that you're okay. going through. So if you are, if you purify your peptides by dialysis, how do you make sure that the side chain uh, protecting groups and components used for solid phase synthesis uh, uh, are removed? Are removed prior to animal yeah. studies. Right, no, that's a yeah. great question. So typically what we do is, uh, there's a, so we do the synthesis we then cleave from the resin using trifluoroacetic acid. We crash out an ether. We dry off the ether. So by this time, there's virtually no organic solvents. We then dissolve that pellet in uh, in water. So uh, so the TFA removes the protect, protecting groups as well, right? Trifluoroacetic acid. We then dissolve it in water and we dialyze um, about 100 mils against about 60 liters of water. So we're mm -hmm. pretty sure <laughs> that uh, all the impurities are out. Uh, however, subsequent to that, we do do LCMS for um, for verification of purity as well as uh, identity of the peptide. I see. Cool. AJ, I hope you uh, received your uh, answer. So uh, the next question is, uh, uh, what is the effect of uh, proteases on these uh, self-assembly uh, peptides? The peptides, right. Um, and do these peptides degrade quickly in a water environment? Yeah. Right. So, so the advantage of these peptides specifically is that in aqueous solutions, they self-assemble into uh, these dimers or multimers and eventually into these fibers. Because they, self because they assemble on their own, uh, upon their own volition, right? Because they self-assemble on their own, they form hydrogels that are relatively stable. Um, so in aqueous solution, we've seen at 4C, virtually no degradation over several week periods. At 37C, uh, you have about 5% degradation, going back to Moses' question, uh, over about a month or so. Uh, Lao flies, these peptides are highly stable. Um, but yeah, I mean, th 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 that's one of the biggest questions that, that we think about and we ask when we think about translation as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, the, cool. Again, just, just summarizing, the advantage of the self-assembling domain that provides some stability to proteases uh, or, you know, or water hydrolysis. In vivo, it's a different ball game. In vivo, you've got a bunch of enzymes, proteases, things like that. So it's a real wild west there. And really the only thing that we think is helping us there is the self-assembly, keeping it together. Uh, and therefore, instead of just diffusing away like most boluses do, or uh, RADA or, or other injectable hydrogels that degrade relatively quickly, we think we'll find a sweet spot. That, that I mean, the converse is nothing infiltrates and the gel never degrades and you form a fibrous capsule. So that's not as bioactive either. So we think we'll find a sweet spot where our materials rapidly infiltrate within three to seven days, degrade over a three to four week period, um, but allow, but at least allow sufficient presentation of signaling uh, and, and drug delivery, growth factor delivery uh, in this time frame as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, um, so the next mm -hmm. question, uh, what are the minimum peptide concentrations required for uh, uh, oligomerization? Do you have an idea of the... <laughs> Energy energetics <laughs> yeah required, required for depolarization of a single yeah. dimer pair um yeah. you know you know it, it, those are those are questions which i was not trained to answer and those are questions that i'm trying to answer now understanding how we can decouple self-assembly is something that we are trying to address through nmr uh, and we're getting some interesting data there again going back to ph modulation and salt modulation um sorry i, I I missed the first part of that question. So, so what is the minimum peptide concentrations required for oligomerization? Yeah. Um, yes. As far as I know, right? So, so when you think about most amphiphiles out there, you might think of a hydrophilic head, a hydrophobic tail, and mycelization or something like that. In our case, I don't know and have not observed in the past any kind of micellar formation. What we principally see is beta sheets extend the fibers. So lower concentrations, you just see fewer fibers or shorter sheets, right? Shorter fibers. Um, answering your question, we, we've diluted samples down to, you know, um, so typically we analyze at one millimolar or we dose in the millimolar range. We've diluted down to nanomolar, uh, sub nanomolar, um, and we've seen efficacy with COVID, for example, uh, our COVID peptides. And we've also seen self-assembly through AFM of very, very short fibers um, or, yeah, very, very sparse fibers. Like the more, the more concentration you have, the, the larger it gets. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think to answer the question, probably down to nanomolar concentrations, we still see uh, some kind, some level of fibrillation. Um, 
And okay. I guess th there's a related question. What are the minimum? Oh, yeah, no, I said, yeah. Um, no, that was the same. Uh, right. So the next question is, did the teeth uh, treated with a cellular peptide hydrogel responded normally to the dental pulp tests? Uh, right. So, so this is a big disadvantage of our uh, study that we just published. So the big disadvantage is that we did not do pulp sensitivity testing. It's easier to do that in humans as opposed to canines, uh, but we did not do sensitivity testing. Now, one of the reasons we didn't do sensitivity testing was because we looked at one time point, canines expensive, right? We looked at one time point at one month and we looked at it histologically. And to ensure that we didn't damage the pulp as we extracted the tooth, we sacrificed the animal, cut into the jaw and extracted the entire tooth, right? To ensure that the regenerative pulp didn't dislodge or damage. Um, so because of that, in that first study, we didn't do pulp sensitivity testing. Uh, ongoing studies, we hope to do pulp sensitivity testing as well as uh, cone beam CT, which is like CT on the tooth itself, which looks at blood flow as well as um, uh, the density of the, the tooth around it. So if you have good pulp regeneration, it supplies nutrients to the dentin, the dentin gets thicker, the pulp tumor gets smaller. Um, so yeah, so, and we can observe that in, in longer term studies. So we're trying to, we're writing a grant to get funds to do canine work up to one month, three months, six months. Um, and hopefully see long-term regeneration and, and obviously do pulp sensitivity testing. Well, good luck with the grant. <laughs> hopefully next year or maybe two years from now after you get the grant, we will invite you again. And, uh, Please, yes. <laughs> we will see the results. So uh, I have one more question uh, from you, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, it's about the... Uh, uh, the uh, you know again commercialization uh, of these these uh, uh, peptides and these technologies. Yeah. What are the challenges with uh, large scale production of these uh, peptides? Have you? So, yeah, and so, also I add the uh, I, I add the cost. Could you elaborate on the cost per uh, unit uh, gram or yeah. ml or? Yeah, uh, no, definitely. So one of the advantages that we uh, purport that we sell when we go out and pitch. So part of what I do is uh, act as, you know, one of the president, CEO, what have you, of the companies. And so I go out and pitch to different investment groups and what have you. One of the advantages that we say that we have is a low cost of goods. And, you know, obviously at scale, everything low, gets lower in cost. But even at the pilot piloting scale, right? So even when we're trying to test this out in the lab, it costs on the order of about maybe uh $3,000 a gram, right? So, so to give you an idea of how much it costs, um, anywhere between $1,500 to $3,000 a gram. And once you go to GMP at scale, that cost actually decreases slightly because, you know, when you make uh, GMP does increase price, but at scale decreases. So it's about $3,000 a gram. In terms of dosing, we typically dose, um, I got to calculate from molar to, we typically dose somewhere around 10 mix per mil. Right? So you look at about 100 doses uh, for $3,000, so about $30 a dose, somewhere around there. Then that's cost of goods. Then, of course, you have fill and finish, uh, purification, things like that. Now, coming back to Moshe's question, in terms of scale up, this is challenging. Uh, in fact, uh, Pure Matrix, the guy who made uh, Rata, I think the company's called uh, 3D Matrix, out of Shugang Zhang's lab out of, uh, at MIT, their company, Rata, they spent years, several years, and they have numerous patents that are filed just on purification and scale-up. It's challenging. These self-assembling peptides, they self-assemble, meaning when you run them through a column, it just clogs up the column. And for the next two days, everything you run has a little trace of peptide coming out as well. Um, so that's, that's another reason we use uh, dialysis, because you know, columns are expensive, um, but at, at least for the, the large-scale purification. Um, but yeah, so so I think I think the, the peptides are not cheap, but they're sig definitely significantly cheaper than um, what is this than monoclonal antibodies and what have you. So uh, at least we have we have it there compared to small molecule drugs. You know, it's a harder sell because obviously once you have a synthetic scheme, you can make them for cents on the dollar or what have you. But um, yeah. All right. Well, well thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Kumar, 
so I have no more questions at, the, at this stage. The audience, if you have any uh, other questions, feel free to uh, to use the ask a question box. Uh, Human, do you have uh, questions to ask? No, no. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, this is, this discussion uh, with uh, Dr. Kumar, and looking forward to see more advancement uh, next Thanks. year. Uh, uh, from your well, research one more group question. and also your startups. Yeah. <laughs> one more question, Human. I just looked at my notes. Uh, so, I, uh, uh, so, so these peptides. I'm sorry. Uh, so these peptides are uh, they have angiogenic uh, properties, right? Do you think you can uh, use them for combinational? therapy so maybe mix them with like drugs with different you know mechanism with synergistic effects and you treat know, different diseases i'm hoping you're going to be reviewing my grant <laughs> in fact we have we have a grant going out in uh on the 26th and another couple on the june 5th uh and in both of those grants one in both of those grants uh what we're proposing is different self-assembling peptides with different functionalities in one construct or using angiogenic peptides along with anti-angiogenic drugs or vice versa to modulate disease um yeah. but yeah no fantastic question that's exactly what we're doing that what we're trying next because this anti-angiogenic factors uh uh so uh so you you use their and like the app i mean use them for uh, you know uh, amd but exactly. age uh, macular degeneration but they have other applications in even uh, brain tumor uh, diseases because uh, people are using, you know, bevacizumab in both applications. So uh, maybe that could be another avenue that uh, that you could explore maybe in the future. I have been, so so one of the things that you mentioned most of them was that you you guys have some experience with glio models, and one of the things one of the reasons we made the GRP seventy eight inhibitor hydrogel, the anti angiogenic drug, was because of glioblastoma research. Like we, we had a lot of interest in that. It just so happens that uh, while we were doing some other research, we saw that it might be applicable in wet AMD. We got some funding, so we went along that path. But mm -hmm. we would love, I mean, I, I'd be very interested in, uh, in, in collaborating on that. Yeah. Um, we just don't have expertise in the cancer space. Uh, mm -hmm. And from what I've heard, it's, it's a hard space to tap into, so good for you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, so we just haven't had that experience yet. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, sorry, I just, I just looked at the note and then... <laughs> I thought I should ask it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumar, for your very nice and inspiring presentation. I, I really enjoyed it, and I, as, as as usual, I learned a lot from from uh, from uh, our speaker. Uh, so I also would like to thank uh, the audience for participating in this uh, e-seminar uh, series today, uh, and um, uh, I'd like to invite you to. Uh, to join our next uh, seminar, which will be next week by uh, Professor uh, Ashamakhi. Uh, so uh, it, it's going to be a, another exciting talk. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank our sponsor, uh, Transmed Tech, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, who has been uh, with us since the uh, beginning, almost the beginning of these uh, e-seminar series, uh, and with that, and if Human doesn't have one, have anything to add, I'd like to uh, end this session. I just want to thank everybody and Dr. Kumar, and uh, keep in touch and uh, uh, take care. Uh, hopefully, you. after COVID, we can uh, get together somewhere in New Jersey or in Montreal or Victoria. Thank <laughs> you, Victoria. Yeah, stay safe. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.